Let's say you have a sensor that outputs an analog voltage. That could be a light sensor or a temperature sensor. And let's say you've got a microcontroller and you want it to read that analog voltage. One of the easiest ways to do this is to use an analog to digital converter, or ADC. Most modern microcontrollers have ADCs built in, and the STM32 is no exception. To test the ADC with our Nucleo board, we're going to connect a simple 10K potentiometer to 3.3 volts and ground. We'll connect the wiper pin to A0 so we can read the voltage. Take a look at the Nucleo L476RG pinout, and we see that A0 on the Arduino headers is connected to PA0. We'll want to take a peek at the timing of the ADC, so we'll connect a scope probe to D2, which is connected to PA10. Start a new STM32C project in STM32Cube IDE and give it some memorable name. Zoom in on pin PA0 and assign it the ADC1 in5 function. If you go into the analog category, you can see that our L476RG has three separate ADC peripherals, and each peripheral can read from various pins, also known as channels. Go to ADC1 and set channel 5 to IN5 single-ended. For a basic one-shot single conversion, we can leave these settings alone. Note that if you want to perform consecutive conversions from one pin, scan through different channels, fire interrupts, or set up DMA, you will have to mess with these settings. Let's also set pin PA10 to a GPIO output so that we can measure our one-shot ADC timing. Save and generate code, and then open main.c. In main, we see that we have a handle to our ADC peripheral as well as a handle to UART2, which we'll use to transmit our ADC readings. The cube editor automatically configured the UART for us as we told it we're using a Nucleo board. In the main function, declare two variables, raw to store our 12-bit ADC reading, and a 10-character buffer that we'll fill out to transmit over UART. The first thing we'll want to do in our main loop is to set PA10 high so we can begin timing. Next, we'll start an ADC conversion by calling HAL ADC start and passing in the address of our ADC handle. We then call poll for conversion, which causes the processor to hang while it waits for an ADC conversion to complete. Once the conversion is done, we get the value from the ADC channel register and store the raw value. Since it's a 12-bit value and we're using 3.3 volts as our reference voltage, the raw value can be from 0 for 0 volts up to 4095 for 3.3 volts. We then set our GPO pin low to stop our timing. We'll use sprintf to create a string out of our raw value, and we'll then spit that message out over the UART2 port, which is connected to the ST link on our Nucleo board. Finally, we'll add a brief one millisecond delay here. Since we're using string functions, we'll need to include the string and STDIO libraries. Let's compile and start debugging. Run the code and open a serial monitor to get a printout of the raw ADC values. Try twisting the potentiometer back and forth, and you should see the numbers rise and fall to reflect the changing voltage. Now, let's attach an oscilloscope probe to ground and pin D2. When we measure it, we see that it takes our code about 9 microseconds to start the ADC, make a conversion, and then copy it to a memory location. That might not seem like a lot, but it can add up if you need to make a constant stream of conversions very quickly or measure several channels at a time. What I just showed you will work in many cases where you need to make infrequent ADC readings. This could be a temperature sensor or you need to measure battery voltage. But let's say you want to capture audio streams or you're making your own oscilloscope. You'll need to be able to capture and store a lot more data than that in a short amount of time. We don't want to bog down our CPU, so we need to rely on another peripheral. In this case, we need to use direct memory access, or DMA, to move data directly from the ADC into a memory buffer. Here is a very oversimplified view of a microcontroller with a central processing unit overseeing a number of peripherals. These peripherals might be internal, like memory, or they could interact with the outside world, like the ADC or I2C bus. Normally, whenever we interact with a peripheral, all data to and from these peripherals must pass through the CPU. In our previous demo, for example, we read a value from the ADC, store it to memory, and then read the value from that memory address to send out over the UART peripheral. This is easy to implement, but it can quickly bog down our CPU if we start moving too much data. 
Some microcontrollers, like our STM32, have access to an onboard direct memory access controller, which functions like any other peripheral. We spend a few cycles up front to configure the DMA controller along with the desired peripherals. For example, let's say we want our ADC to continually take samples and store them to a large buffer in memory. With that, the DMA acts like a large pipe that funnels data from one peripheral to the other while the CPU goes off and does other things. The DMA controller will continue to pump data from the ADC to memory until we tell it to stop or we set some stop condition, like a particular buffer is full. To show a more simple example, let's start by piping data from a buffer in memory to the UART. Note that some DMAs will let you do peripheral to peripheral or memory to memory connections, but you will most often see them being used to pass data between a peripheral and memory. If you take a look at the reference manual for the L476, you can see that there is a whole chapter dedicated to the DMA. Note that the L476RG has two DMA peripherals. You can see how the first one is connected here, where each channel is like one of our pipes. While you can set up multiple channels on each DMA, only one channel can be communicating at a time, and note that you can assign different priorities to the channels to determine who gets to talk first. The second DMA controller works similarly, but it is connected to different peripherals. This controller can also be used to do memory-to-memory -memory transfers, but neither can do peripheral-to-peripheral -peripheral in the STM32 architecture. To pipe data from memory to UART2, take a look at the DMA1 table we see that channel 7 is connected to USART2TX, so that's what we'll need to use. Let's see how to use DMA with UART. So start a new project and give it some name like DMA UART test. In the cube viewer, we see that USARTTX and RX for USART2 is already set up for us. We also have PA5 connected to the LD2 LED, which we can use to make sure our interrupt callback is working. Go into system core and DMA. Add a new DMA request for DMA1 and select USART2TX as we want to send data from memory out over the UART port. Note that it automatically assigns us to channel 7. That's all we need for this example. Save and generate code. In main.c, you can see that the DMA instance has already been configured for us. It's important to note that DMA1 channel 7 is initialized with interrupts. We'll need an interrupt to occur to let us know that we're done with the memory transfer. In the HAL MSP file, you can see how the DMA was actually set up in code. These should reflect the parameters you set in the CubeMX interface. Finally, in the interrupt file, you should see a place for your interrupt handler for DMA. Feel free to put your interrupt service routine code in this function, or I'll show you how to register your own callback in a minute. Back in main.c, create some long and arbitrary message that you want to send out. In the while loop, we want to enable the DMA transmitter bit, which tells the USART peripheral that we plan to send out data via DMA. While we don't explicitly need to do this, as it's handled in the HAL code, we're going to disable it in the interrupt callback, which should, ideally, let you use USART for other purposes. Next, we're going to tell the DMA to start in interrupt mode with a handle to our DMA instance and our message in memory as the source. We set the destination address to the transmit data register, or TDR, of the USART. We also tell it how long our message is. When that's done, it should call a callback function. We could use the interrupt routine in the IT file, but I want to show you how to register your own callback anyway. Both should get called after the transfer completes. We use the HAL DMA register callback function and pass it a handle to our DMA instance. Deep in the HAL DMA driver files, we can find this enum, which details the types of interrupts that can occur. We want to use the HAL DMA transfer complete callback ID, so we write that one here. Finally, we give it the address of our callback function, which we're about to write. Let's declare our callback function, which I'll call DMA transfer complete. We just need to pass it a pointer to our DMA instance. At the bottom of main.c, we can write that function, and all we'll do is disable the DMA transmit bit in USART2 and toggle the onboard LED. Since we use the string length function, let's include string.h. Build the project and fix any errors, such as the one where I forgot to call the DMA instance by its full name, which has a TX at the end. I also forgot to add a delay in here, so I'll make the processor wait for one second before trying to transmit again. 
Start the debug process and you should see your long string being printed out over serial every second. You should also see the LED toggle every second. This tells us that the DMA interrupt and callback are working. Let's combine these concepts by using the DMA to read the ADC and store the results to a large buffer. Go back into our first ADC example and open the .ioc file, which should load the CubeMX perspective. We already have PA0 set as an ADC, so go into the ADC settings. Notice that the prescaler is set to 1, so the ADC is running as fast as possible. Asynchronous mode refers to the fact that the ADC samples can be taken independently of the main CPU clock, and the ADC clock is set to 64 MHz on this Nucleo board by default. It's also important to note that with our 12-bit resolution, it takes a minimum of 2.5 cycles for the chip to take an ADC sample and another 12.5 cycles to make the conversion. If we were to set the ADC clock to 80 MHz, that would give us a max of 5.33 mega samples per second. Since we're only using one channel, we can leave scan conversion alone, but we'll want to enable continuous conversion mode. This will let the ADC continually take samples from one channel and store them to memory. By default, it will just throw an error or overwrite the value in its register if we don't read it fast enough. However, with DMA, we can keep all those samples in memory. Notice that we can't enable DMA mode yet as we need to go to System Core DMA and add a DMA request that's connected to our ADC peripheral. In normal mode, the DMA transfer will stop whenever it fills up the buffer. We can set it to circular mode so that once the buffer is filled, it will just start again from the beginning of the buffer. Just make sure you read the data fast enough or you'll lose it. We do want to increment the memory address after each read, but we leave the peripheral increment address unchecked as there's only one register that we get ADC values from. Notice that the data width is changed to half word. We're dealing with 12-bit values and a half word is 16 bits, so that's a good size for our data. Back in the ADC settings, we can now enable DMA requests. The other settings should be good in their default states. Save and generate code. In main.c, we want to define a pretty good size for our buffer. How about 4K samples? We also want to create a buffer of unsigned 16-bit integers to store these samples. We can get rid of our old example code, as we're using DMA now. Lucky for us, the STM32HAL library has a function that will start the DMA attached to the ADC for us. We just need to give it a handle to the ADC instance, our buffer, and the size of the buffer. I'll compile to make sure I wrote these correctly. However, we do need to add some callbacks, as our code won't know when the buffer is full. HAL gives us two callbacks for the ADC that are super helpful. The first is the HAL ADC conversion half complete callback. Since the ADC is tied to the DMA controller, the ADC now considers a full conversion to be complete only when the entire buffer is filled. So this function is called whenever the buffer is half filled. We'll toggle the LED high here. The other is the HAL ADC conversion complete callback, which is called whenever the buffer is completely filled. We'll set the LED pin to low when that happens. This is a great way to set up a double or ping pong buffer. You can notify your main code to do something with half the buffer while the other half is being filled by the DMA. Let's start debugging. I'll set a breakpoint in my first half callback. Once the program stops here, I'll take a peek in the buffer. You can see that it was very quickly filled by the ADC and DMA. Note that the second half was filled too. The ADC and DMA will continue to run even though we stopped the processor with our debugger. Remember, this is all happening even though there is nothing in our main while loop. You can continue to run code while the DMA is happily filling up that buffer over and over again. Let's crank the knob up to 11. If we peek in the buffer again, we can see that new values were filled in, this time denoting the max voltage from the potentiometer. I'll add a scope probe to D13, which is connected to the LED. Let's remove the breakpoint and let the code continually run. If we bring up the scope, you can see the LED toggling very quickly. Half the buffer, which is over 2,000 samples, is filled in just under half a millisecond. I know these weren't necessarily practical examples, but I hope they help you get started using the analog to digital converters as well as direct memory access in the STM32 line. Please check the description for a link to the code and please subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this. Good luck and happy hacking. Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you.